All right, I want to start out this morning talking about a, just giving a little quick testimony here of an older brother that passed away this past January. Uh, just to, this is going to tie into the sermon today. But uh, this brother's name is Manuel G. Ergundon, Ergundona. Let's see if I said that right. Try to pronounce it the proper way. Argandona. Manuel Argandona is his name. Um, basically, uh, uh, his grandson wrote to me about him, and uh, this uh, older gentleman here was 83 years old, and he came from Mexico. And in Mexico, he never went to school, ever. No schooling at all. And as he grew older, he taught himself math and also how to read. And here's the interesting part that I want to make the point about. He read, when he learned how to read, he read the King James Bible. And he understood what he was reading. Now see, they'll, they want you to believe, the people out there, the new versionists, they want you to believe that you can't understand this book. It's old, it's archaic, you can't possibly understand it, you can't possibly read it. You have to have all kinds of education and everything else. Not true. Here's a perfect testimony of a, of a brother in Christ, not even from this country. English wasn't his native language. He came from Mexico, absolutely no schooling, taught himself to read, and he could read and understand the King James Bible. You know why? Because this is a spiritual book. And the Holy Spirit can open the pages of this thing and teach you. I heard a guy say the one time that this is the only book that the author is present every time you open it. I thought that was pretty good. You know, the Holy Spirit is there to teach you of these things. And as I said, he went home to be with Jesus on January 3rd of this year, 2012. So, just an interesting little testimony there to an older brother in the Lord that could read and understand the King James Bible. And we're going to be talking about something that's kind of in line with that today. Many of you might not know this, but today is a very big national holiday for a specific religious organization. You say, what's that? Well, today is Happy Atheist Day, also known as April Fool's Day. <laughs> you know, the atheists get all excited because they don't have, you know, they, they get mad and stuff at religion. We don't have Christmas or Easter or whatever. Well, you know, there's issues there, I realize. But, you know, they do have their own holiday, April Fool's Day. Now, today I'm going to try to stick a lot with science because that's what atheists, you know, they say that we are not scientific. So I'm going to use three words today to describe atheism. And I'm going to read these definitions from the Webster's 1828 Dictionary so that you can see I am being scientific. <clears throat> Okay, the first word, fool. There are three definitions here I'm going to read. One who is destitute of reason or the common powers of understanding, an idiot. Some persons are born fools and are called natural fools. Others may become fools by some injury done to the brain. <laughs> I call that college education. <clears throat> Number two, in common language, a person who is somewhat deficient in intellect, but not an idiot or a person who acts absurdly, one who does not exercise his reason, one who pursues a course contrary to the dictates of wisdom. Uh, the third definition. In Scripture, fool is often used for a wicked or depraved person, one who acts contrary to sound wisdom in his moral deportment, one who follows his own inclinations, who prefers trifling and temporary pleasures to the service of God and eternal happiness. Then it says here, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, Psalm 14. The second word I want to define here is the word idiot. We saw there up in the first definition that a fool is an idiot. Okay, according to Webster, I'm, I'm not being mean or anything here. You know, hey, it's, it's right there. Two definitions here. Idiot, a natural fool or fool from his birth, a human being in form but destitute of reason or the ordinary intellectual powers of man. A person who has understanding enough to measure a yard of cloth, number 20 correctly, till the days of the week, is not an idiot in the eye of the law. Number two, a foolish person, one unwise. <clears throat> the third word I'm going to use is the word stupid. Okay? Again, it's dictionary definition. I'm not, you know, I guess I'm kind of being mean here, but <laughs> see what the definition is. Uh, stupid. Definition number one. Very dull, insensible, senseless, wanting in understanding, heavy, sluggish. Oh, that men should be so stupid grown as to forsake the living God, 
With wild surprise, a moment stupid, motionless, he stood. <laughs> uh, definition number two, dull, heavy, formed without skill or genius. Observe what loads of stupid rhymes oppress us in corrupted times. <laughs> so he's putting little, you know, poetry in there, I guess. So today, in this study, when I call atheists stupid and idiots and fools, I'm just using dictionary definitions. Okay? It's what they are. Turn in your Bible. Go to about the middle of your Bible there, the book of Psalms. Psalm 40, or uh, excuse me, Psalm 14 is where we're going to start out. Now I showed you how the dictionary defines a fool, but now we're going to see how God defines a fool. Psalm 14, verse 1. <clears throat> okay, it says here, The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. Oh, atheists can be moral people. We have our own morals that don't have to be defined by Scripture. Sorry, that's not what God thinks about you. God says if you're an atheist, if you say there is no God, it's not because you have proof that there is no God. It's because in your heart, you don't want to accept God. You don't want to accept the reality that God is real. That's why there are atheists. And I'm going to, I'm going to prove that today. I'm going to show you some of their own philosophy, some of their best, their best thinkers. I'm going to show you what they say. I'm actually going to play some video of them while you'll hear audio on the sermon. Now we're going to go to the other one, Psalm 53. Psalm 53, verse 1. <clears throat> and we're going to see that God actually repeats the same thing here. Again. And He gives a definition of atheists. Psalm 53, verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart there is no God... Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. So again, you see it there. But now what does, it, what does this prove? This proves that atheism is not something that just showed up recently. There have always been people that refuse to accept the reality of God. Way back there in the Old Testament, thousands of years ago, people were, were saying back then, I don't believe in God. I deny God's existence. You say, well, modern science has proved that God isn't real. Nonsense. Modern science, my, modern real science actually verifies the Bible. All right? This isn't about science. This isn't about proof. This is showing you that there's a philosophy that dates back for thousands of years where people are denying God. And why? Because they're corrupt. They do abominable works. There's none that do with good. And it says, too, that they say in their heart. It's not a thing up here where they can scientifically prove God's not real. They're saying it in their heart, the way they feel. That's why they're denying God. Now we're going to go to the next book in the Bible, Proverbs chapter 18. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 18, we're going to look at verse 2. Now I'm going to show you the, this is the real philosophy behind your modern college education. This is what's really going on here. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2 says, Now remember, the Bible defined a fool as what? Somebody that denies the existence of God. So here we have again, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. What did Jesus Christ say about the heart of man? It's uh, desperately wicked and deceitful. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to discover their heart through their education. And when an atheistic Quote unquote scientist will do when they discover something out in nature that confirms the Bible, they reject it. They find some kind of a fossil and it's and oh man, this looks like this was some kind of a thing that you know was buried in the, in the flood in the days of Noah. Oh, I better reject that. We'll just look for a, a skeleton of a monkey that we haven't discovered yet and we'll say it's the missing link or something stupid. You know, that's what they're doing. They have no delight in understanding, they have no delight in facts and documentation unless they can discover their own wickedness, unless they can defend their own wickedness through their facts. That's what modern-day atheists are all about. Now, you say, well, maybe an atheist can find God in our modern college system. Go to your New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm going to show you something here that's very interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 18. 
on the subject of intellectualism and education. We're going to see who God actually gives it to. And I kind of gave you a little bit of a hint earlier there at the beginning of the sermon that uh, that brother there, Brother Manuel, that, that passed away in January, God gave him wisdom and understanding. And you're going to see why. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now notice it does not say the preaching of the cross is to them that perish a respectable thing. Ah, what we preach, what we teach, that Jesus Christ, a Jew, went out and he was, he was killed on a cross and the blood that he shed is enough to pay for your sins. The lost world doesn't respect that. It's foolishness to them. They go, oh, come on, you Christians are so dumb. It's right there. That's the way it's supposed to be. And as a Christian, you better not try to pretty up the gospel. You better not try to make the gospel neat and up to date and whatever else. Let's continue. Verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? See, the world looks at us as fools, and in fact, God looks at them as fools. You get an atheistic, communist, you know, one of these evolution guys in the colleges, these big professors, and God looks at them and he goes, you're a fool. You know, that's what the Bible says there. So you say, I want to find God. Well, you better stay away from the university. Because God, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Yeah. We'll continue here. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You mean to tell me God would choose a uneducated Mexican immigrant to save and to show the secrets of his word? He would choose him over a PhD from Harvard? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's the way God works. God will use a man, a simple man, a common man that has faith and just says, yeah, I believe it. God wrote it. And doesn't have to get into all the intricate details and try to explain God away. That's not who God will use. God will use the common man. Verse 22, For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified un unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In other words, even if, if God could be have some foolishness or weakness to him, even if he did, it would still be stronger than the very brightest minds out there. Still be better than the very brightest people. Verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren... How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Hmm. Well, God God goes to the best universities, the best seminaries, and he picks out the very best minds to, to really use. No, quite the opposite. Who did Jesus Christ come to when he came to this earth to pick as his disciples? What were the majority of his men? Fisherman. Commercial fishermen. <laughs> what a group to go to. I mean, you want to find a rough group of, of men, go to commercial fishermen. They're probably one of the roughest groups out there. You know, and Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, chooses them to use. Yeah, absolutely. And I have found many times in my life, usually the guys that are working in the common man, you know, types of jobs, construction, farming, you know, whatever, Jobs like that, working at a store, stocking shelves, or whatever things like that, usually those are the ones that have the strongest faith. The ones that have gone through the Bible colleges and the seminaries and they have all the right attitudes and they dress just perfectly and everything else, usually those are the ones that are, that are just <laughs> uh, you know, whited sepulchers, basically, as, as Jesus described them. They look nice and clean on the outside, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones. Look at verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. 
Why? Look at verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Hmm. You know what's going to be interesting? A lot of these big big shot PhD you know, guys and stuff, these big doctors, professor at Harvard and all these great intellectuals, you get a guy like Albert Einstein, just miserable, lost, old devil that he was. You're trying to come up with his theory of relativity, you know, to explain away God. And he'll get up there before God someday at the great white throne judgment. And he'll be standing there and he'll, he'll look over and he'll see a guy like his brother, Manuel. And he'll go, wait a second. You let him into heaven? This uneducated Mexican immigrant? You let him in and you're not going to let me in? I'm Albert Einstein. And the Lord's going to say, yeah, and you never accepted me. You know, I choose the weak things of the world, the things which are despised. I'll choose a brother like that or a man like that over somebody like you that thinks that you're smart enough to explain me away. That's how the Lord does things. And that's saved and lost. But even among the saved, I've seen that thing, like I just mentioned, God will choose the weak things. God will choose somebody who isn't really all that well respected in life. And he'll say, I'm going to use that guy right there. God doesn't go for the educated elite. He stays away from them. And you want to see that demonstrated, read the Gospels sometime. Who was given Jesus the most problems? It wasn't the common man. It was the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, you know, the Herodians, all these big elite people. They were the ones that were giving Jesus a hard time. Now we're going to go to chapter 2. Just jump down there. I want to show you a couple more verses before we continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. It says here, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. Hmm. Well, we really, we really need to raise up a champion against the atheists out there, and he's got to have all the right words to speak and all the right arguments. Uh-uh. All you need to defeat atheism as a Christian is just to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. My faith has found a resting place, like we were saying this morning. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Oh, that's not enough. You have to show scientific evidence. You have to show proof and everything. They won't pay attention to it anyhow. <laughs> Remember what we read earlier there? The fool has no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover it itself. They don't care about documentation. They're just going to argue with you and keep you sidetracked. When you run into an atheist, the very best thing that you can do is just say, are you a sinner? Well, organized religion has killed thousands of people and the Bible has contradictions. Are you a sinner? I went through this big thing with this atheist and he was just attacking and profanity and all kinds of stuff like that. And I kept saying, but according to the standards of the Bible, are you a sinner? And if you are, are you going to go to heaven or hell? He refused to answer it. Finally, he said, no, I'm not a sinner. And I said, there you go. You're self-righteous. That's why you're an atheist. That's the whole issue here. I don't need anything else. You don't need anything else than just to say, hey, Jesus died for me. I know the Bible's true. You don't have to go through all the proofs and everything else. The proof is there, but you don't have to know all that stuff. I know that Jesus died for me. That's it. That's probably what that brother there knew. Brother Manuel there. Now, do atheists just, are they just kind of innocent and they just are kind of, you know, ignorant? They don't really know any better. Is that the case? Let's go back to Romans chapter 1. One book back from 1 Corinthians there. Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 20. I've been over these verses before in other studies, but they're so good, they, they really prove the point. We're going to hit them just another time here. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. You're going to see the progression here, how the thing gets worse and worse and worse. And this goes for a culture, for a society, but also goes for an individual's life. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that, so that they are without excuse. You can look out at nature and you can pick anything out there and say, did this come to, to pass by random chance? Obviously it didn't. Verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Hmm, isn't that interesting? The Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Right there it says their foolish heart was darkened. Hmm, interesting. Verse 22, what do they do after this happens? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Well, I have a PhD in evolutionary biology. Well, then you're a fool. Congratulations. <laughs> Verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, you see it again, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature <clears throat> more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Sodomy, in other words. Do we see that in today's universities? Absolutely. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, I'm not going to read down through the other verses there for sake of time, but... You can see what follows. And you can go down through that list there, unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. You go down through the list and you look at any college university and you can pick all those things. You can pinpoint all of those things that come as a re result of a reprobate mind. You can find them all there in abundance. Why? Because God's word is true. <laughs> Yea, let God be true and every man a liar, like the Bible says. So you have the progression there. Number one, they ignore creation because they don't want to give God glory. They look and they see the flowers and things like that, and they don't say, wow, Lord, this is beautiful. Look what you created. Boy, the Lord's given us a wonderful day. Ah, uh, they don't want to do that. They say, isn't this wonderful that this flower evolved over millions of years? They don't want to give God the glory for what he's created. Then they profess that they are smarter than other people. If you don't agree with them, well, then you're, you're dumb. You know, you're not educated. Quite the opposite is true. Third, they begin to worship the creation instead of the creator. Then after that, they attack the word of God. The Bible has contradictions. It's not accurately written. It's a man-made book, blah, blah, blah. Fifth, God gives them up to commit the sins that they wanted to commit in the first place. God just says, okay, go ahead. You want to do that? You want to live in sodomy? You want to live in fornication? You want to live wickedly? Go ahead, do it. And eventually, they lose their minds. <laughs> And they begin to sin and they just live a life of sin in there and whatever. Verses 20 through 32. I'm sorry, 29 through 32. Now let me just show you, since we're talking about science today, and again, this is for the people here, but you can listen to this thing. Exhibit A. Here are two snowmen candlesticks that I made out in my wood shop. Okay, I used to make these things and sell them, you know, they're just little, uh, they're made out of, these two are made out of poplar, actually. But I would turn these things on my wood lathe, and then I'd put the dies on and everything else. Now, would it be possible, would it be scientific to say that these things created themselves? No, I don't think so. Would it be possible that they came into, into existence by random chance? No. How about if I left, take two pieces of poplar, you know, cut a tree down, split it or something like that. Or we'll just say a branch falls off like we had here, you know, this past Halloween. We had a storm and all these big branches are falling down. How long would it take for that branch out there in nature to evolve into these? Hmm. Would it be possible? No. There is absolutely no possibility that these could happen by random chance. None. 
I don't care if you have millions and millions and millions of years and slowly the you know they'd rot away and stuff and then and form and how are you going to get the dye on there? How are you going to get the organization, the complexity there? Okay, now here's the question. What's more complex? These candlesticks here or us as people? So these couldn't have happened by chance, but we did. You see the lunacy of that thing? Excuse me, the foolishness, the idiocy, the stupidity of that? What's the problem there? Well, if you look underneath these things, there's my insignia and the date on there. Why? Because I'm the creator of them. You see? And we don't have a, a date or anything stamped on us by God, but the point is, God made us. Now see, somebody comes along and they say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Those snowman candlesticks are so beautiful. I bet they evolved over millions of years. Well, what's going on there? Well, they don't want to give the creator glory. And I used to go to art shows and things, and they, people come up and they'd say, wow, you really do beautiful work. You know, and it wasn't like I was there for that, but the point is they're just speaking the truth. You see, you look at the creation, and then you look at the one who created it, and you say, hey, you do beautiful work. Psalm 139, verse 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Yeah. We should give God glory for the things that he has made. That's why I love nature so much, because you look at the complexity of it, you look at the beauty of nature, even down to something as simple as a bug. If you ever look at some of the bugs out there, little beetles and things, the, the designs on them are so intricate. I mean, God could have just taken things like flowers and just, you know, it's red, and that one's yellow, this one's blue, you know. But you look at the complexity of those things, there's multiple collars, there's designs on them and things. Incredible. Just incredible. Marvelous are thy works. You know? Just to look out there and say, oh, it all just happened by chance. Well, that's stupid. <laughs> There's no nice way to put it. But now, what if these snowmen met together and they had a little conference and they said, I believe that we came into being by chance and I don't believe in our Creator. I don't believe, I reject Brian Denlinger. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Would I have the right as their Creator to throw them into that fire over there? Mm -hmm. Yep. Would I be justified in doing that if they rejected me and didn't want anything to do with their Creator? Yeah. You see, these don't have life. They're inanimate objects. But the point is, we do have life. And God has given us life, and He has the right to do with us what He wants. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in this world is God's. This room is... The electricity in the walls here, the, the land here, the, the food, our clothes, us, everything is God's. And he has a right to do with it whatever he wants. And that's what the atheists don't like. But speaking of stupid atheists meeting together, here's the thing in our local paper, and this is just, this cracks me up. I might actually put this on a YouTube video. Of course, the religious zealots of atheism are going to attack me then. Uh, probably try to get my channel shut down. They'll do that because they're religious fanatics. Here we have the Saturday, March 24th, 2012 Faith and Values section. And what do we have here is the main article. An atheist. Wait a second. What's an atheist doing in the Faith and Values section? I thought they're about science. Wouldn't an atheist say, hey, I don't want to be in Faith and Values. I'm a science. I, we're, we believe in science. We reject faith. No, they want to be in it. And here's why. Scott Rhodes will be spending part of this weekend in congregation with like-minded individuals. No, he won't be in church. Far from it. Then it goes on to this whole thing that they're going to have this big meeting in Washington. I guess this must be this weekend or something. Or maybe last weekend. They wouldn't want to meet on their, their national holiday day, you know. But uh, it says here, Rhodes, a 41-year-old married father of two, founded the Lancaster Free Thought Society in August. I saw the secular movement heading places I wanted to go, and there was no local way for me to get there, Rhodes said. Rhodes, an unemployed building inspector, said the secular movement has been growing in recent years. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then it goes down through here. I'm just going to hit a couple of things in this article. 
says, noting that there are more than 30,000 different sects of Christianity. It's funny because they repeat that thing over and over and over again. There are 30,000 sects of Christianity, so it can't be true. Um, could you name them? I, I mean, hey, we're about science here, aren't we? You know, let's let's be atheistic here, these people, these fools. You know, let's let's give me the names. I want to see the names of this 30,000 different sects. Link me to a website or something that has them listed. They don't have it. And you'll see these apostates, even these, you know, weirdo New Age types of people, and they'll talk, they'll bust on Christianity and say there are 30,000 different sects. I've never seen the list. But I guarantee you, if you saw the list, it would be Catholic, Muslim, it would, it would be anything that would use the Bible or something like that. There aren't 30,000 different sects. As Bible-believing Christians, we realize how small the real true number of saved believers are. But see, what's going on is these stupid atheists, what they'll do is they are too lazy themselves to read the Bible and to study the Bible, so they just blanket all Christians as religious fanatics and killers and whatever else because they're too foolish to actually look into it. Let me continue here with the article. His becoming a free thinker has been a journey, he said. He attended the Evangelical Church of God growing up in Schuylkill County. At one point in my teens, I considered myself born again, he said. He began to meet people with different viewpoints at college in Williamsport. Seems I've heard that one before. I don't know. I'd say my love of science probably helped more than anything. Science requires evidence, and when you start to put the rules of evidence on religion, it's hard to find it. <laughs> yeah, he said. Rhodes decided to read the Bible with a science-oriented mind. He also studied different religions. And he goes on to say that because he's so scientific, then, you know, I can't accept the Bible. You know, I had to become an atheist. Yeah, translation. He was a false convert in his church that he grew up in, as we've talked about many times here then he went off to a or to a secular university and he was introduced to evolution and some you know idiot communist atheist professor which a lot of them are and he brainwashed him against the bible turned him against the bible didn't show him both sides you know you can't teach creation science in these universities what's that tell you you know oh if you go to a public school if you go to a public university like a secular university you're not allowed to bring creation science in there. You're not allowed to talk about God or the Bible. Why? What are they afraid of? They're afraid of the truth. You see, they're religious fanatics. That's what atheism really is. But then it goes on to say here that this uh, he's going to be going to this meeting of fools coming up here. It says, among the scheduled speakers at the Reason Rally are Richard Dawkins. We're going to hear from him in just a little bit. Scientist and author. Yeah, scientist. Yeah. Scientist and author of The God Delusion, Bill Maher, comedian and host of HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, another foul-mouthed idiot, and Adam Savage, co-star of Discovery Channel's Mythbusters. I always kind of figured that that guy was. I just kind of had a bad feeling about him. So there you have the religious fanaticism right there of, of atheism, what they really believe. But you say, now, come on, I don't agree with that. It, atheism is not a religion. Well, let's go back to Genesis, the very beginning of your Bible, and I'm going to show you the foundation for all false satanic religion. And again, we've been over these verses before, but I'm going to hit them one more time. Genesis chapter 3. And if you can get this, this thing figured out, you'll be able to see through any false religion out there. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 is where we're going to read. It says here, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He questioned God's word. Hmm. I thought questioning God's word, you know, higher textual criticism, you know, destructive textual criticism. I thought that was spiritual. <laughs> no, it isn't. These new version scholars are in the position of Satan. Verse 2, 
And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not touch it, or ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She added to the word of God. God never said you aren't allowed to touch it. Uh, verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Again, he questions God's word. Change the truth of, of God into a lie, like we read back in Romans chapter 1. Now look at verse 5, and here it is. Get this philosophy down, and you'll figure out false religions. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What is atheism? That's it right there. When you eat of the forbidden fruit, the knowledge that comes to you, the tree of knowledge, see, you go to your university and you get your PhD, now you have the knowledge, and now you can transcend that foolish religion stuff. This foolish old preacher in the old country churches, you know, up there, fire and brimstone preachers, you can transcend that. You can know the difference between good and evil. You can figure it out for yourself. Right there is the foundation for all false religion. So give me some examples. Okay. How about Catholicism? In Catholicism, if you work hard enough, you can eventually become who? The Pope. Okay. Now, what is the Pope? According to official Catholic doctrine, I've shown this in, in videos. According to the Catechism, the Pope is God on earth. He used to wear a hat, and he doesn't wear this very often anymore, but it used to say Vicarious Philly D in Latin. That stands for Faithful Substitute God. That's what it stands for. And if, according to official Catholic doctrine, it says God made man so that man might become God. That's in the Catechism. I've showed that. How about Buddhism? Well, if you do meditation long enough, you can eventually transcend good and evil. You know, you get to the point where you can control your mind and you can do the breathing and all the other stuff. Yeah. In Buddhism, that's the teaching. You eventually become a god. What's Where did I get that uh, philosophy from? Well, Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Satan uses that same trap to deceive people that he's used for thousands of years. How about Mormonism? Well, eventually you become a god of a planet and you have multiple wives and you produce spirit babies. <laughs> That's what they teach. They won't tell you that when they come to your door. They'll act like they're Christians. They're not Christians. How about Hinduism? Well, again, you know, if you're a good person, every time you die, you get to come back as something better. And if you are reincarnated enough times in your, you know, transmigration of souls and all this other garbage, you, come, you basically become part of the universe. Mm -hmm. And what would be another way of saying that? But you become a god. You transcend good and evil. See? How about Islam? Well, they, they tend to say a little bit more that you, know, you have to follow Allah or whatever. But uh, how often do you hear the, the Muslims talking about Allah? They talk mostly about Muhammad. And I would say that most of them hold Muhammad in greater esteem than they do Allah, which is a false god anyhow. So again, you have this man who was a sex pervert, Muhammad, and he's elevated to godlike status. Again, you have the same thing, that same satanic philosophy. How about communistic atheism? Well, first of all, what you do is you eliminate God in the Bible, and then you kill and torture your enemies. <laughs> you know? And you say, oh, now, nah, come on. You know, this is another one of my favorite things to use on atheists because they'll say, organized religion has killed millions of people. You know, tens of millions have been killed. And one said that to me the one time in a comment on YouTube. And I was like, okay, what about uh, communistic atheism? 160 million in the 20th century alone? Between two countries, Russia and China? Russia killed 60 million, China 100 million? And you want to tell me about 30 million killed by organized religion? Yeah, tell me all about it. What a bunch of fools. And by the way, they say organized religion killed you know tens of millions. Who did they kill? They didn't kill atheists. They killed Bible-believing Christians. So it's like, you, know, you have no argument there. These atheists have no argument. <clears throat> How about Darwinian evolution? 
Well, that teaches that man evolves and gets better and better and better and actually becomes homo noeticus eventually. Right now we're homo sapiens sapiens, the wise, wise man, you know, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And eventually you become homo noeticus, the God man is what you become. Now, a lot of them won't, they won't come right out and say that, but that's what they believe. I mean, hey, if man gets better and better, what's it eventually become? What do you eventually become? You become a god. That's what it would be. Now you say, well, boy, that's some scary groups there. You know, that's, that's bad stuff. Yeah, and you know what the bad thing is? When all these idiots decide to work together, that's going to be the new world order. All these different groups, when they all come together, when they all join hands against Bible-believing saints, that's going to be the new world order. That's going to be the one world government. And they're getting close to doing that. You're starting to see this thing of let's all join hands. Let's And watch out for that. I've heard that in the patriot movement. We need to put aside our differences and join together to fight this great evil. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to join hands with sodomites. I'm not going to join hands with Catholics. I'm not going to join hands with Buddhists or New Agers. I don't care. I don't care how bad the quote-unquote Illuminati is. I'm not going to join hands with unbelievers to fight against them. Jesus Christ is our only hope. And you won't hear him, you know, let's fight the New World Order. Well, what about Jesus? What about salvation? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> he's the only hope. Jesus is it. But you say, well, I don't agree. Well, atheism is not a religion. Well, let's look at a couple points here. Four points. Number one, atheists have an agenda and fight to destroy other religions. I'm not going to get the article out there, but that article I showed you earlier. That's why they're meeting together. They want to put an end to religion. Now, if I was an atheist, a real atheist, and I didn't believe in, their, in God, and I didn't believe in religion and whatever, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't spend any time messing around with Christians. Hey, believe whatever you want to believe. I'm just going to go do what I feel like doing. But you see, that's not what's going on. Atheists are religious fanatics. They really are. And like I said, if I decided to put this sermon where I'm calling them fools and idiots and stupid, if I put this on YouTube, they would try to shut down my channel. Just like any religious fanatic would. Sodomites and atheists, they will shut down channels on YouTube. I've had friends' channels that have been shut down by those two groups. They will fight. Here's another one that's interesting. Another proof that atheism is religion. Atheism must be accepted by faith. You can't prove that there is no God. You don't have enough proof for that. You know, you would have to know 100% of the details of the universe to prove that there is no God. You can't do that, so they have to believe in it by faith. Atheists fight to be respected and recognized, as I showed in the article. We have an official organization. We have official, we're going to come together and march on Washington and declare our rights. Why? If you guys know the truth, I mean, if atheism is the truth, why bother organizing? Just, you know, laugh at religion and live your life however you want to. Atheists are busy proselytizing. They want to go out and make as many converts as they can. They're paying for billboards all across this country that are putting up and attacking the Bible. We had a big thing here recently. I forget where it was. It was in this area somewhere. It might have been up towards Harrisburg, you know, the state capital. capital. And they had this big billboard up about break the bonds of your slavery or something like that. And they had a Bible. And then they had a picture of a black man with chains around his neck. And the, the you know, black people in the area just like went ballistic. I mean, he just went nuts. You know, because I mean, just a direct slap, you know, at the at the black people. You know, uh, just, and they, they took the billboard down real quickly. But again, if atheism is a fact, if it's proved by science, oh, why bother trying to convert other people? Just laugh at other people, you know? That's not what it's about. They're religious fanatics. Now, is, athe is atheism growing in America? Well, this is an article in The Guardian, October 1st, 2011. Rising atheism in America puts religious right on the defensive. The exact number of faithless is unclear. One study by the Pew Research Center puts them at about 12% of the population, but another by the Institute for the Study of Secularism in Society and Culture at Trinity College in Hartford 
puts that figure right at around 20%. Most experts agree that the number of secular Americans has probably doubled in the past three decades, growing especially fast among the young. It's very true. There's a lot of atheist teenagers out there, you know, high school and college age. Um, it is thought to be the fastest growing major, quote-unquote, religious demographic in the country. Interesting that the Guardian would call atheism a religion, you know? Secular newspaper, they're not Christians, but they call, they, they compare it to a religious, you know, organization. They can see the truth. But now let me ask you a question. Is there a decline in intelligence in our world right now? Yes. Here we have the Atlantic article here. It says, falling SAT scores widening achievement gap. The class of 2011's SAT scores are in, and they're not good. The College Board announced Wednesday that mean SAT reading scores have fallen to their lowest levels in nearly 40 years, dropping four points in the last four years to 497. Furthermore, only 43% of test takers achieved a total score, indicating that they are likely to succeed in college. Less than half of them are actually going to make it through their college education. Why? Because the IQ is going down. And again, secular news. And you can look it up, you know, Google it. <laughs> and you can see all these statistics. Yes, people, in, the IQ is falling, intelligence levels are falling. And of course, here we have the creation science evangelism, and he shows a chart in there. I'm not going to turn to it, but he shows a chart where the SAT scores have been plummeting since the 1950s, when evolution started to enter into the schools. Now, let me ask you a question. I wonder if there's a connection between the rise in atheism and the decline in intellect. <laughs> oh, no, that would be a conspiracy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes, there is a connection. The more foolish people become, the more IQ is going to drop. Now I want to play a little video here. Take a minute here to set it up. Okay. Uh, what we have here is a ex-KJB, or KGB, excuse me. This is a Russian KGB man, and he was saying, he's talking about how that they tried to bring communism into America. And it's going to be a little bit hard to understand him because he's got that Russian accent, you know. But just listen to what he says here about how that they have come in and they tried to demoralize the American school system and try to turn people against the Constitution, against what America was, and to bring in atheistic communism. And if you look at our modern-day schools, that's exactly what they are. So this is kind of an interesting art or a little thing here. It's only about five minutes long, but he says some really inter interesting stuff. So here we go. But in reality... The main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of its intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, actively meropriatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and is divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, 
dropouts or half-baked intellectuals are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind, even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid of society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of, the, uh, of the United States society. And yet these people have been programmed and, as you say, in place and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept. Mm -hmm. These are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock when, when they will see in future what the, what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, obviously they will revolt. They, 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 will, uh, they, they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they, obviously, they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Yes. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. Uh, here you can, you can get uh, popular like uh, Daniel Ellsberg and filthy rich like Jane Fonda for being dissident, for criticizing your Pentagon. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. Nobody is going to pay them nothing for their beautiful, noble ideas of equality. Let me just pause it there for one minute. In other words, what he's saying is these liberals that are saying we need to destroy the Constitution, we need to take guns away, we need to destroy what America has always been and bring in politically correct speech and all this other stuff, eventually they're going to see, oh no, we didn't want to do this. Oh no! It's our our rights and our freedoms are being taken away, you know, because the Constitution was there to protect our freedom, and eventually they're going to see the folly of atheism of this athe atheistic communistic system, but it'll be too late for them then, and that very system that they helped to build is actually going to turn on them and destroy them. We'll continue. This they don't understand, and uh, it will be greatest shock for them, of course. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already uh, for the last 25 years. Actually, it's overfulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his, then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. Right, but in some. reality, oh. the main emphasis of the KGB is... There. I'm back to the beginning again. Isn't that interesting? How many people have you run into online or whatever if you're on Facebook or, or if you're on YouTube or wherever else, how many people have you run into with that exact ideology? It doesn't matter how much information you show them. And, and you know, even in real life, people you work with, family members, friends, whoever, doesn't matter how much information you show them. No, I don't think I can believe. No, no, no. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's just, it, oh, man, it's bad. Now, that video there was from way back in the 1980s. How much worse has it gotten since then? Isn't that something? And we have a president right now who is essentially a communist, 
among other things. Obama's trying to bring in socialized, or socialized medicine, socialized all kinds of things. He's trying to shut down power plants. What did they do in, in communist Russia? They came in and said, you're not allowed to farm. And they wouldn't allow certain people to farm so that there'd be a food shortage. Hmm. What's the government doing right now with raw milk products and organic things? You see, what do we have? We have communism taking over. Atheistic communism. How many people really truly believe the Bible is the word of God today? Even among professing Christians. See, it's a problem. And I'm going to show you in a minute where this thing is leading to. Okay, but now we're going to hear from the one of the leading idiots out there for atheism, Richard Dawkins. And I'm going to show you that their beliefs, atheistic beliefs, have nothing to do with real science. I'm going to show you that it's an attitude. The fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Listen to what this guy says here. What do you think is the possibility that their their intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an and a intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. Okay. Now that's a little clip from this video right here. Ben Stein expelled. Now, he's not a Christian or anything, but the point is he pointed out how foolish atheistic evolution is and how dangerous it is, the fact that Hitler believed in evolution. Okay? But did you see the thing there? I believe that aliens created man. So, you'll believe in aliens, space aliens, but you won't believe in the God of the Bible. Why? Well, because space aliens won't judge you. They won't tell you that you're a sinner, that you're useless, that you're going to go to hell and burn. They won't tell you that. See? You can be self-righteous with a space alien. And by the way, space aliens are just devils, I believe. Alright? I do not believe in intelligent life from other planets or something like this. Sorry, I don't believe in that. I believe that, that Satan and his angels are deceiving people. And I think in the very near future, you're going to see Satan and his angels you know, physically present on this planet. The Bible talks about that. As in the days of Noah, so too shall be in the days before the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus warned about that. What was going on back in the days of Noah? Well, the sons of God were coming in under the daughters of men and bearing children. Another study. Now we're going to hit a couple more passages here and then we'll be done for today. Revelation chapter 9. We're going to go to the end of the Bible. And I'm going to show you, actually, that atheism, as far as people saying, I don't believe that there is a God, it's actually going to end in the future. But their attitude, the attitude of atheism, that they're unrepentant and they blaspheme God and they hate God, don't want God in their lives, even though God will eventually be proved to them or they can't deny Him, they still continue in their wickedness. We're going to see that. Revelation chapter 9, verse 20 says here, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. 
Now, could you apply that to today? Absolutely. Every time we have tornadoes, every time we have some kind of natural disaster or some kind of bad thing happen here in America, do the people repent? Do these atheists come out and say, maybe there is a God. Man, 150 tornadoes in one day. There, maybe there is a God. Maybe he's angry. They don't do that. They go right on in their sin. And by the way, when you see this thing of idols, of gold and silver and wood and stone and everything, that doesn't have to mean, I mean, we in our minds we think of some little guy sitting there with three arms or something like that, or Kali or whatever, you know, the Hindus or Buddha or something like this. It doesn't have to mean that. An idol of metal could be that Lexus out in the driveway of these evolutionary professors that they worship. It could be their position at their college. It could be their huge big mansion that they live in. The desire of your heart, the thing that you center your life around, that you identify with, is your God. You can have different idols. doesn't mean you have to be bound to them and praying and everything like that. There are different idols that are out there. Now jump down to Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Can you see God right now? No. So is there a mystery of God right now? Yes. Okay. We as Christians can know him. We can hear from him as long as it's in accordance with his word. God will show you things through the word. Right now he speaks to man through his word. But in this future time period, the mystery of God is going to be finished. There won't be any more mystery that, oh, maybe God doesn't exist. And at the end of the tribulation, God himself in the form of Jesus Christ is going to come down and rule and reign for a thousand years with us, his saints. Okay, I don't know what Jesus Christ looks like. I've never met him face to face. I believe in him. My faith has found a resting place in Jesus Christ. But I don't know what he looks like. But someday my faith is going to become sight. And so will all of yours. Someday you're going to see Jesus Christ face to face. Make sure that you're on the right side. <laughs> okay, But right there, the mystery of God is going to be finished at some point in the future, in this tribulation time period. And they say, the atheists say, oh, I'd like to see proof that God exists. It's coming. It's coming very quickly. Revelation chapter 15. In the book of Revelation, there are three different judgments, three different series of judgments. You have the seal judgments, and then the, the trumpet judgments. Seven trumpets are blown. Seven seals, seven trumpets. And then at the end, after the seventh angel sounds, like we read about there in Revelation chapter 10, then after that seventh angel blows his trumpet, now you have the seven vile judgments. Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now I've heard people say, well, the tribulation is not the wrath of God. <laughs> Read it. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, we're not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. You can get out of this stuff. And there again, you know, the atheist, oh, your God's so cruel. He would be if he provided no way out. But the way out is so simple. You don't have to travel to some special city, some place, and stand on your head for three days or something like that. No. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's simple. It's easy. You'd have to be a fool to reject Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jump down to Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. Now remember, this is after the mystery of God is finished. Look what happens here. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of waters of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, uh, shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and of prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty. Now look at this. 
True and righteous are thy judgments. God has every right to do what he did there. But now how are they going to explain this one? It cracks me up some of the, the explanations they're coming up with to try and explain away the wild weather and these other things that are happening. They're starting to lose control. The news media is losing control. They can't explain this stuff anymore. Science, what we know about science, meteorology and whatever else, they're getting to a place where they can't explain things. And what's going to happen here at this point in time, it's going to be over. All the little stories, all the little we believe in evolution, we believe all this stuff came to, you know, by chance and all of a sudden, it's over. It's done. Okay? There's no more mystery. So then at this time period, men all over the earth are going to give God glory. They're going to be thankful. They're all going to become Christians. Right? Look at verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with great fire. There's global warming. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be true. Uh, verse 9, And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. You mean even after God is a proven fact, evolution is proved false, and God is pouring out his wrath on these people, even after that they still don't repent? Yeah. You know why? Because the philosophy, the true philosophy of atheism is hatred of God. That's why they believe what they believe. They're not, you know, I'm convinced by science. That, that idiot earlier in the article. I went to college and I, I read the Bible from a viewpoint of science and I was convinced it was false. No, you're not. Guy's a liar. There's scientific proof all through that Bible. You know, we talked about hell the other week. You know, hell is proven by science. The location of hell, it's in the heart of the earth, just like the Bible says. Science has verified that. But the evolutionist, atheist, communist will look and they'll say, I don't believe that. You know, and they'll actually contradict the laws of science. They'll say, well, it's probably solid rock down there or something. They'll deny science when it contradicts their feelings. Just incredible. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Like we read earlier. The Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. You see, it all ties together. You go back to Psalm, you go to Romans, you come here to Revelation, it all just links right together. You say, Well, that's because it was written by man. Well, that's true. It was written by man, but it was inspired of God. And those passages... Psalm, Romans, and Revelation, those are written, Revela or Revelation and Romans are written probably almost 100 years apart. Maybe, well, maybe not 100 years, probably 50 years apart. But what about Psalm? Thousands of years before then, and they're writing things in Psalms that link perfectly with Romans and Revelation. And you can read through the whole Bible and then go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. And you have a tie-in with the philosophy of evolution. So spanning thousands of years, and yet it all intermeshes and ties together. Hmm. Oh, but it's just a man-made book. I don't think so. All right, look at verse 10. Revelation chapter 16, verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. You know, towards the end of the tribulation, God's actually going to shut off all the lights. And I believe at that point in time, I believe the mark of the beast and the whole technology thing will be there for the first three and a half years. But after that, the, the judgments of God are going to get so bad that I think towards the end of the tribulation, there's not going to be any electricity left. I think it's going to get so horrible at the end there. I mean, can you imagine living in pitch black darkness on this earth? I mean, right now we have that light and we have that light over there on. Shut those off. Well, we could still see because sunlight outside there. Shut that off. What are you going to do? Well, we have a couple flashlights around and stuff. You know, I got, I carry a little flashlight in my pocket here. How long are the batteries going to last if this is your only source of light? Not too long. Oh, our, our flashlights are all gone now. What are you going to do? 
we'll try to find some sticks, you know, stumble around in pitch black darkness, try to find some sticks and light them or something, you know. That's what's going to be like at the end of the tribulation. And you would think at that point in time that they would repent, that they would cry out to God and say, please, God, we're sorry. But they don't. Why? Because it's not about proof, it's about philosophy. That's what's going on with atheism. Verse 12, And the sixth angel uh, poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now, isn't that interesting? You say, well, I don't believe these you know, presidents and rulers and things. They're just kind of you know, wicked to have their own accord. Not according to the Bible. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spiritual wickedness and everything else there. What do we just read about? The spirits of devils that appear like frogs. And they go out to deceive the kings and to bring them to battle. And you talk about a deceived populace. All these kings, the, you know, the leader of America at that point in time, and the leader of Russia and China and all these other countries... And they're going to bring their army together to fight against Jesus Christ? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you want to see how that thing works out, read in Revelation chapter 19. The kings and the armies end up as bird food. All right? Oh, that's not politically correct. Well, that's your Bible for you. It's the truth. See, the Bible, you know, people say the Bible's a violent book. The world is a violent place. That's reality. Okay, you can't live in your little opium pipe dream anymore of saying that I think peace, we're going to have world peace. You're crazy. You know, one of my favorite things that I've said to people is, I can't even get along with members of my own family. How am I going to get along with members of other countries and other religions? <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> but uh, we'll continue here. Verse 17. <clears throat> and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the fr throne saying... It is done. That's kind of interesting. Let me just stop there for a minute. What did Jesus say when he died on the cross? Is it is finished. So you can either show up at one of two places. You want to show up at, with Jesus Christ and be with Jesus Christ and you go to where he said it is finished. Your salvation that you need to get out of this horrible time is finished on the cross. He finished it there. You don't have to work your way. All you got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're saved. That's it. So you can either have it is finished or you can make it to there where it says it is done. And if you're one of the few that survives, you know, basically over half the world's population, they say about two thirds of the world's population is going to be killed in this time period. Those aren't very good odds. You know, it's like going into a say you go to some big sports stadium and somebody gets up and they say, OK, 65 percent of you are going to die. What are your odds of getting out of there? Not too good. <laughs> you know? That's what's going to happen in the tribulation. The odds of you making it through that time period are not too good. Verse 18. We'll read a couple verses here and then we're done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. The biggest earthquake on record right now was a ten. 10.5 or something like that. I think it was back in the early 1900s or something. I think it was in Turkey. But the Fukushima thing is right up there in the top five, I think. That was a nine. And look what happened. Pretty bad. There's coming an earthquake to this world that's unlike anything anybody's ever seen. Isn't that something? Look what happens. Verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometime and just see the there's just no mercy and the hatred of Christians. Killing whole families, torturing them to death. Just horrible. I mean, just just ah, it gives you chills reading that book. 
And God has not forgotten about it. And his wrath is going to be poured out on the Catholic Church, which is Mystery Babylon. Great Babylon there. Now look at verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Can you imagine that? Now here, you can look out the windows over here, and you can look over that way, and there's a big ridge over there. You know when we come back, that isn't going to be there anymore? That's how bad this earthquake is going to be? You say, oh, I remember I climbed Mount Everest. We'll come back at the end of the tribulation. Where's Mount Everest? It's gone. Where are the Rocky Mountains at? I'd like to go vacation in the Rocky Mountains. Sorry, they're gone. They're not found. That's how bad of an earthquake is coming to this world. Just incredible. Verse 21, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. After all the vile judgments, the men are still blaspheming God and they're not repenting. The mountains are removed. The world is just wrecked. And these people that are left are still blaspheming God. Isn't that incredible? What does that show you? That shows you when you run into a true atheist that has been given over to a reprobate mind, answer not a fool according to his folly. Just take that as your scripture. Just say, see ya. You're going to be judged someday. You are a sinner. You're going to go to hell. Jesus Christ is the only hope for you. Oh, you're crazy. Okay, see ya. You see... Like that guy was saying, that ex-KGB officer, he said there are people that you can shower them with facts and it won't mean a thing to them. That's a true atheist right there. Somebody that it doesn't matter how much proof. All the things that are going to happen in the book of Revelation and yet they still don't repent. Just incredible. And those people are around right now. That's the amazing thing. I believe that that generation that fulfills that scripture, I believe they're alive today. I believe that they are the youth, these people that you see on the internet that hate God and hate the Bible and they don't want to hear any proof and they will try and you know, get you shut down. And they're trying to take away our religious freedom. That's the real true atheistic movement. Those are the ones that we have to deal with. All right. So you don't owe them any respect. The Bible calls them fools. They are stupids. Stupid, they are idiots, and they are fools, according to the dictionary definition. Anybody that would look out and say, this world happened by chance, hey, that candlestick right there, that thing came into being by itself. You're a fool. Oh, you have to respect me. You have to show me respect. No, I don't. You tell me that my God doesn't exist. You tell me that this world came into place just by random chance. You're a fool. So, if you're an atheist out there and you listen to this, and of course they wouldn't have never made it this far. You know, atheists are very narrow-minded, very bigoted. But if they did, you're a fool. Happy Fool's Day, April Fool's Day. You know, <laughs> enjoy your day. And enjoy the little bit of life that you have here because your eternity is going to be in hell. Now, if you listen to this thing and you're an atheist and you're saying, well, maybe I should reconsider some of this stuff, Jesus Christ is the answer. You say, what about hypocritical religion? We reject it too. Listen to the other sermons. We reject, we talk about false conversion here. You know, we rip on the Catholic Church. We rip on organized religion. We're not accepted by organized religion. And if organized religion ever gets political power, and they have, you know, some of that, but if they ever get it to the greater extent, they're going to go after us. Organized religion isn't going to go after atheists. When's the last time that you heard the Catholic Church persecuting atheists? They don't bother them. They go after Bible believers because we're the threat to them. So that's going to be it for today. Have a happy Atheist Day. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. 
You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.